This season of The Ones Who Succeed is brought to you by Skillshare. You have to have self-awareness and you got to be comfortable in your own skin to do this because being an entrepreneur is a little bit like being punched in the face every day. Hi, my name is Campbell Barron and I'm a 15-year-old entrepreneur and content creator. And you are watching my video podcast where each week I meet with inspiring entrepreneurs and talk to them about their journey to success. Hear their stories, experiences, and firsthand what it took to succeed in their field. Why am I doing this? Because I want to learn from the ones who succeed. And you can too. looking at you so yeah you're looking or like yeah and then this will just get a more close-up shot of my pores well just and my face is peeling face. yeah, yeah okay all, all right welcome back to another episode of the ones who succeed i'm campbell Barron, and today i have a very special guest nancy lublin hello nancy is the founder and ceo of crisis text line a free 24 7 text support line Nancy is also the founder of Dress for Success, a nonprofit that provides professional work attire to women in need entering the workforce. As well, Nancy also served as the CEO of DoSomething.org, Do Something being another nonprofit that motivates you to make positive change through campaigns that make an impact. And just when you thought I was done my intro, Nancy recently started an AI company called Loris AI, which we will get to towards the end of this interview. Thank you for making the time oh, to no, meet with me. Oh, no, coming down from Canada to yeah. <laughs> Brave America and talk to me. So throughout your career, it just it seems like you've had this, this drive or this want to help people. Were you like that at, at a young age when you were a kid, let's say 15? 15, yes. I've always been very social changey, make the world a better place. The interesting thing is I come from what I describe as a mixed marriage. Yeah. So um, my dad's a Republican and my mom's a Democrat. That's okay. what I mean by a mixed yeah. marriage. And, um, and both pretty hardcore on each side. And so we would watch um, the news as a family together every night and have dinner together every night. And okay. you were expected to come to the dinner table with something to say. Right. And so we always talked about social change things and you always had to be informed and switched on to the world. So pressure from a young age to yeah. contribute to the world, yes. And it seems like at a, like right now as the CEO of this big uh, organization, you seem very gritty. Were you like that at a young age? Were you gritty? I don't know that. I, I, I don't think I, I don't know. Angela Duckworth hadn't coined that term yet. So back okay. then it was called scrappy. So like I've always just kind of gone a different direction. So I guess now it's a good thing and it's called gritty. Back then everyone was like, she's a little weird. Right. And who's going to marry her? And um, how is she going to support herself and make a living someday? And um, um, there, like, there wasn't the word entrepreneur. No one, no one even it's, knew how to spell it. No one true. knew what it was. Yeah. So it, I was just weird. You were weird. It's just weird. Did you feel weird within your friend group? Totally. Absolutely. You were the outlier. Well, I was an outlier because I also because I was good at sports and um, a good student, so I, I didn't really fit in either of those groups because they weren't really buds. And then I didn't, I wasn't really a good group person. Um, so <laughs> you seem you mentioned scrappy at a young age. Yeah. Do you think that meant you were hard to parent? A hundred percent. I mean, a hundred percent. So yes, and it's such a. That is such an insightful question. And if you were, if my parents were sitting here, they would say the same thing. I mean, I was a little bit confusing, right? So I wasn't, I'm still hard to parent. I mean, I had a, um, there were years after I had dropped out of law school. And then when I finished law school that my father only like five years ago, and I'm 47 years old, stopped asking me when I was going to take the bar exam and, and go, um, and go start my life. Right. So, um, yeah, I think that when you choose a path that's unfamiliar makes your parents nervous here's the thing i would say um it's not just parents it also it makes my husband nervous <laughs> that um it's very hard to love an entrepreneur it's true because you care about the entrepreneur and you just want them to be happy right and you want them to have like a good nice 
predictable future and path. Yeah. And, and, um, as the, as the entrepreneur yourself, you believe in your idea so much that you're like, I'm cool with this roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you're, you're, I'm, see the, I'm cool with this roller coaster. Um, but as the person who loves the entrepreneur, you're not steering. Right. So you're both nervous and you have no control. The entrepreneur at least has control. So I actually think it's harder to be a parent or a spouse of an entrepreneur than it is to be the entrepreneur. I think that's the only thing harder than being an entrepreneur is I, loving one. I completely agree. But you mentioned law school, right? Yeah. So you went to law school. You dropped dun, dun, out. Dun. During law school, you founded Dress for Success. Mm -hmm. What is the story behind that? Because definitely, you know, you're a lawyer, you mentioned thinking inside the box, but then you start this organization that's kind of thinking outside the box. How yeah. did that happen? So I came home from, it was like a February, a cold February day where like the rain goes sideways into your face. And I came home and there was an envelope in my mailbox with the return address from a lawyer okay. in Hollywood, Florida. And I didn't know there was a Hollywood in Florida. Yeah, and I didn't I, know either. Right? There you First go. And time. I didn't know this lawyer. And I was like, ah, someone's suing me. So I opened up really like slowly and carefully. And inside is one of those extra long like typed checks made out to me from the estate of my great grandfather who had come to this country with nothing at the turn of the century and, um, and had died years earlier. So it wasn't like a surprise that he was gone. But it was a surprise to get $5,000. And I hadn't earned it. Just so it was given. It was like what five thousand like what you're supposed to be happy your great grandfather's still gone yeah so um like what do you spend that on i didn't it wasn't mine and i got in the elevator and i thought about him and his legacy and i thought i'm going to use this to help people get started in america and claim their destinies the way that like he got started he was a peddler he came here with nothing and so i um so i had the idea for dress for success in the elevator and for the people who do not know Dress for Success provides professional work attire for women in need interviewing for jobs. And in 19, boy, 1996, 97, when I started this, people were still wearing suits. Like it was, it was like a, you know how you can't step on like a, a baseball pitch without your uniform. Right. You you couldn't you couldn't go to a job interview it without your suit. It was a then. big deal, and they're expensive yeah. and and different kind of clothing. And so yeah, so we gave suits to women going for job interviews. There are so many nonprofit organizations so out there. Many. So many. If how do you and this is this was your first organization. Yes. How do you like convince people that you, your organization should be the one that they give their money to or they support? Because you just believe in it so much and you're so convincing. Um and you just have passion and you put it all out there. Coming up, I continue my conversation, but first, a quick message from our sponsor. This season of The Ones Who Succeed is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in business, marketing, technology, design, and more. You can take classes in social media marketing, video editing, entrepreneurship, you name it, they've got it. So whether you're trying to deepen your professional skill set, start a side hustle, or just explore a new passion, Skillshare is there to keep you learning and thriving. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today, because Skillshare is offering the first 250 people who click the link in the description two months of unlimited access to over 20,000 classes all for free. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash succeed. Again, that's Skillshare.com slash succeed to start your first two months now. That link is also right here on the top right corner of this video. And a special thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this season. In 2013, you founded Crisis Text Line. Yep. It sounded like a, you, it kind of happened by accident. It did. I What's mean, the I, story behind that? So um, at Do Something, all of those members are by text. Right. So Because that's, my guess, is how you communicate with people. You probably also use WhatsApp, maybe. Well, and text is, that's a big component. Big thing. Yeah. Yep. So text. And, um, and you really, my guess is you only really text with your parents, your friends, maybe some of the people you interview from the show. Yeah. Parents and friends. Great. So, um, so you trust your messages and you open every text you get way more than emails for sure way more right email you've got spam you've got filters yeah. um and so um because of that when do something started texting with members who all opted in no spam yeah. people felt close to do something and so they would share things like you would share with your parents or friends by text and um they would share these deeply personal things and do something didn't have expertise in that and that's not what do something does and um 
there were some there was some pretty harsh content. I don't know if you want me to get into the specifics of the, those get messages. Into if you want, if if I mean, people were talking about bullying and they were talking about domestic violence situations. And then we had a texter who said um, that um, he won't stop raping me. It's my dad. He told me not to tell anyone. Are you there? That was pretty dark. And um, we sent back the phone number for Rain, a rape and incest organization, um, and actually never heard back again. Really? Yep. And I've tried to text and call that number multiple times. It's been seven years. Never heard back. I don't know if uh, it was a burner phone or um, if her dad saw it or if she's dead or alive. And, and it was actually pointed out to me about six months ago. I don't even know that the texter was female. So as I look around, you know, in this office, if it didn't say crisis text line on the wall, I wouldn't know. I would just think it's a regular tech startup. You know, it's definitely yeah. it's a ra- it's cookies, yeah, donuts, you know, free cereal. Food, yeah. But the type of work you guys are doing is definitely not relaxed. You know, there's I'm sure there's some stress involved. Yeah. How do you build um, a relaxed culture or a culture that is a little bit, you know, and not as heavy as the kind of work you were doing, but in reality, you know, the work you were doing is pretty intense. That's another really great question. Thank you. So I would say there are three answers to that question. One is, I think you'd be surprised that the subject matter turns out to be pretty darn uplifting because while the messages are coming in hot, they're leaving cool. And so you feel pretty great. So like it's hard subject matter and we definitely see hard conversations, but um, we're good at it. So, so it feels better than you would think. The other two answers are structural and personal. So structural, to build a good culture, you, you try and put as many structural things in place, traditions, time off, um, uh, habits, practices to enforce positivity as you can and kindness. And you'd be explicit about that. And the second, the, the, the last one, sorry, the third way is, um, is personal, that um, my immaturity is super helpful um, my sense of humor, I think, is super helpful. I take the work seriously. I don't take myself too seriously. And I think that that has to come from the top. I impale myself all the time by making inappropriate comments and jokes and acknowledging my own failures or questioning something that I've said even just the day before, um, which hopefully makes it more comfortable for everybody else. Yeah. Um, I, I think it would be very hard to be a stiff human and a successful entrepreneur. Most entrepreneurs that you meet are weird. I mean, going back it's to high true. school. Yeah, no, it is true. You got to be weird. And, and, and comfortable with that. Yeah. Like embracing, our, their embracing that freak flag and letting yeah. it fly. Um, you have to have self-awareness and you got to be comfortable in your own skin to do this because being an entrepreneur is a little bit like being punched in the face every day. Right. But just when you thought Nancy had enough on her plate, she decided to start a new venture. And that new venture is a startup called Loris AI, which is using artificial intelligence to put more empathy in the world. And so we're using um, data and analytics to um, teach people um, in companies, so it's an enterprise company, um, how to have hard conversations. And how did you get the idea? How did that start? Companies started saying to us, gosh, you guys have taught so many people how to be crisis counselors at Crisis Text Line. And you have a great NPS score and quality ratings and things like that at Crisis Text Line. Could you teach our employees? And I was like, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so again, it grew out of the rib. This is, I guess, like the grandchild of Do Something, if you think about it. Because Crisis Text Line grew from Do Something, and now Loris is growing from Crisis Text Line. So generations. going to grow from Loris? I don't know. I don't know. Let's get it going first. Yeah. All right. Well, Nancy, I appreciate you taking Thank the you. time to come on the show. Thank you. And why don't we swap mobile numbers and text? Yeah, for and sure. And anytime you feel lonely, uh, I've got your back, Campbell. Awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. year-old aunt who was on her deathbed she didn't have a lot of money but I figured what she had she couldn't take with her so in the hospital on her deathbed I asked her for 2,500 bucks now I got the money but I was not invited to my own family's Thanksgiving that year really and I don't regret it When I was two and an eighth million dollars in debt with no job, I 
didn't think about bankruptcy. I didn't think about giving up. I didn't think about moving home. I just, I, I was upset. I felt like I had an insane setback that was like, ugh. But I just felt like it wasn't a debt that I was never gonna overcome. I was just like, mm, this just set me back many years.